Revolution of 1917 divided the world into two ideological camps, capitalist and communist. For the next 70 years, the communists would wage a war of words and images against their capitalist enemies. The goal? To capture the hearts and minds of the Soviet masses with disinformation. To turn them against the enemy, who they said ruthlessly exploited the average citizen. To turn them toward the state, run by peasants and workers, which cared about their welfare and guaranteed them health, education, and a shining future. A minority party with approximately 200,000 members, the Bolsheviks in 1917 assumed the leadership of 160 million people, scattered across the world's largest continuous landmass. They spoke more than 100 languages and were, for the most part, illiterate. Masters of visual propaganda, after seizing power, the Bolsheviks produced tens of thousands of political posters. Striking pictures and stirring slogans communicated party ideology. Lenin proclaimed cinema the most important art for promoting communist ideology. The animated war for the minds of the people began with short political commercials that delivered the state's message in a clear and entertaining manner. Shown in cinemas everywhere, they encouraged people to form collective farms and join the Communist Party. They promoted the state's tailored vision of Soviet history and fanned hatred of the Americans, the British, the Germans, the Japanese, and world capitalism. Soviet people were stunned when on June 22, 1941, Nazi Germany broke the non-aggression pact signed just two years earlier, crossed the Polish border, and began a war against the Soviet Union. Against all odds, the Soviet army forced the Germans to retreat from the USSR, ousted them from Eastern Europe, and captured Berlin. World War II would leave 20 million Soviets dead and a generation of wives without husbands and children without fathers. Germans, who had not previously been depicted in the animated propaganda films of the 20s and 30s, immediately became the ideological enemy of the Soviet masses. Наша студия почти вся переключилась на политплакат сатирический. Они рождались тут же на ходу, тут же и делались, что-то принималось, что-то не принималось, показывались. Но мы жили этим делом. Мы считали себя мобилизованными, обязанными это делать. Это был заказ. Но это заказ, на который мы отвечали действительно своим творчеством, энтузиазмом. Сейчас веселым представлением я вас, товарищи, займу. Мои излишние объяснения смекнете сами, что к чему.
Иван, ты слышишь меня? Это я, Гитлер. Слышу, Адольф, слышу. Ты знаешь, Наполеон, я хочу завоевать весь мир. Слышал, Адольф, слышал. Я пришел получить твое благословение и твой этот совет. Ох, Адольф, пока не поздно, ложись рядом со мной. Фашистов, змеиная злоба, Будь бдителен всюду, Поглядывай в оба! О коварстве врага. Будь бдителен, разоблачай фашистских шпионов, разведчиков, диверсантов.
songs, documentary and feature films, caricatures and animated political cartoons helped keep high the spirit of the Soviet people. On May 9, 1945, Nazi Germany capitulated. The Soviet victory was celebrated with animation. I think there is a, some profound difference in the way the Germans are depicted and the Americans. Both are bad in those films. But the Americans are shown as bad guys, but they're still human. The Germans sometimes are shown as animals or robots. They're completely deprived of any uh, traces of humanity. Thirty years later, a new wave of anti-fascist films appeared. These films were mostly targeted at Soviet children. Their goal was to create fear that the German enemy would rise again. For Soviet propagandists, West Germany and the United States were part and parcel of the same reviled military-industrial complex. Here, the war in Vietnam becomes an extension of old Nazi ambitions. 